Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Chip Lyons, President and CEO of the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. The Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation is dedicated to ending AIDS in children. Chip has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Chip, for joining us today. Thanks. It's nice to be here. So, ending AIDS in children is a prodigious mission. It is a mission with so many challenges that do not begin and end with, with children themselves. Talk about how you execute this very worthy objective. There are three elements to uh, how we go about it. One is continued research um, because the pr tremendous progress that we've made over the last number of years is a result of research and innovation and learning from experience what works, what works less well, et cetera. So research first. Second, and sometimes this can sound like a generic or a mushy word, but advocacy. Um, uh, and particularly for an organization uh, like ours, one of our great advantages is the clarity of our mission to end AIDS in children and to have that focus. And so our voice, because of our technical expertise and because of our field programs, is one, thankfully, that's listened to. It's sought. We're a leader in ending uh, AIDS in children. And because of our data, because of our experience, what we can prove works that advocacy role is crucial um, because not everyone has a presence in the field, not everyone is implementing these kinds of programs. And so we can be influential with larger organizations and with other governments who have uh, a real role and responsibility to play. And our third uh, strategy is program implementation. We as a foundation, and I emphasize an operating foundation, unfortunately not an endowed foundation, um, uh, we are about a thousand staff. Uh, we're about 85 percent of the staff are in the field in the 14 countries where we work. Um, we have a hundred plus staff in the United States that provide the backup, the system support, the advocacy uh, leadership and some other functions uh, based in in DC. Um, but needless to say that uh, thousand staff is not by itself changing the world when you consider the enormity um, of the countries, the populations, and, and so on. And so that advocacy role is a leveraging role. It's engaging other partners. We work through ministries of health. We work with community-based organizations in each one of the countries where we're engaged. Because at the end of the day, uh, a woman and a child who have HIV and AIDS, or a pregnant woman who's HIV negative and who wants to stay HIV negative, let's say, in Kenya, that's Kenya's Kenya cares more about that woman and that child than anyone outside of, right. of Kenya. And so we don't have Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation's clinics that are ours and that we run with our staff. To reach scale, to really end AIDS in children, you have to work through national systems. And that entails helping to strengthen those systems. It entails training healthcare workers and, and even program planners. Uh, for example, it means monitoring the data, checking on the quality of the data so that strategy and tactic adjustments uh, can be made. And so we're an operating foundation with many, many partners, um, whether they're community-based um, uh, organizations or whether it's the Ministry of Health at the capital or at the provincial or at the district level. And we provide um, a, a sort of quality of services at the site level as well, where our technical staff are able to work with the healthcare workers and others, sometimes even assessing the layout of the, um, of the, of the site. Is it efficient or not? Are people confused in where they have to go next? Because it's a multi-step process to be tested, to be counseled on the results of those tests, to be counseled in terms of treatment that you should start right away, what, are you single, are you, do you have a partner, are you pregnant already, do you already have children, have those children been tested, this multi-step uh, process. Could you talk a little bit about the sensibility that led to the forming of this, uh, of this organization, the experience of these parents, and how that sensibility informs your programs today? 
Um, it's a very good question, and, and it's fascinating to, to go from the origin um, uh, to the point where we are today. Um, and the origin really is that Elizabeth Glazer contracted the virus through blood transfusion, giving birth to her first child in 1981, um, and passed the virus on to daughter Ariel uh, through breastfeeding. Um, they had a second child, Jake, um, who contracted the virus. And Ariel, the firstborn, became ill. Um, nobody could imagine what it was. They tested that, uh, her endlessly, as well as uh, both Paul and Elizabeth and Jake and so on and so forth. And finally, to their astonishment, um, realized that she had the virus and was, um, her immune system was severely compromised and she ended up passing seven years later in 1988. That what the word devastating doesn't capture um, uh, what the family uh, went through um, and it was at that moment where the mission for the foundation really started and it was a mission to save one child's life, Jake. Uh, and so Elizabeth uh, I could go on. Suffice it to say, she did what a mother would do to save a child, which is anything she could conceive of that would be remotely um, uh, useful in changing how the United States thought about children and AIDS. Elizabeth Glazer contributed as much as any other single person in changing the trajectory and the mindset uh, and even the face to a degree. It's a more complicated face. It's not just that. Um, that one vision you have of where AIDS has hit the United States. No, it hits families, it hit, hits children. So where's the commensurate research? Where are the meds, uh, the pediatric formulations that, that children need? So we went from a mission of one to just in the last uh, several weeks, according to our data, we will have reached 20 million women with services to prevent transmission uh, prevent infection and to reduce new pediatric infections. I mean the impact of the work that we've done in reducing uh, maternal mortality among uh, HIV pregnant, uh, uh, HIV women for example is dramatic, 30 percent among childbearing age. We've reduced the number of new infections. Let's go back to Ariel and Jake. Um, the number of Jakes where we, we were able to intervene earlier so that Jake today is healthy, productive, vibrant, smart uh, young man, um, 31, I think, uh, working in Los Angeles and so on. Um, but he has to manage his, uh, the virus. Right. But how many uh, hundreds of thousands of kids um, are Jake without having to carry the virus? Uh, so talk about your work beyond the treatment of children and, and how you go about trying to shift some of the sensibility uh, about AIDS uh, amongst the adults. Well, I, um, I think any parent knows f full well, you just don't even have to think it through, that um, they are the most important uh, person and resource and protector of their children. and and. Um, that's a universal uh, truth. And, and so where we know children to be vulnerable, um, we also know we have to look at the larger context. So and does it start with adult education? It's particularly important that we work with women and, and women's groups. Um, they also carry, in the case of HIV and AIDS, um, the additional, additional burden of stigma, um, uh, which is a severe limiting factor in terms of people going to health services, right. um, even reticence about being tested. Even on that day when a woman goes to, um, for a health checkup thinking she might be pregnant, and in some cultures you don't do that too quickly for fear of jinxing it or just mm -hmm. of, of bad luck. You, you wait third month, fourth month, fifth month, sometimes even later, which of course is not good in terms of antenatal care, um, but imagine that day when a woman comes in thinking she's pregnant, uh, it's confirmed that she's pregnant, gets an HIV test, and at the same time is informed that she's HIV positive. A glorious day turns instantly into a glorious 
day with a nightmare dimension to it because right. she is HIV positive. She's got her pregnancy and goes through a counseling um, uh, session on what the steps are. And the good news is there are steps to virtually guarantee that her baby will be born um, uh, healthy and HIV negative. One of the things that's most important to us is we've got a strategy is, is, of course, has an acronym, PMTCT, the Prevention of Mother-to-Child Treatment, which is a multi-step process that um, does result in 98% of uh, births of HIV pregnant, pregnant women um, with healthy children who don't have the virus. That as a service has to be incorporated into maternal and child health services. It also helps with the stigma issue. Are you standing in the HIV line or are you standing in the maternal and child health line? Um, it helps in terms of the community seeing there's a totality of service that is needed uh, to address um, the health challenges for the family and for the children. Um, and so we care as much about maternal and child health as we do ending new pediatric infections precisely because to achieve our mission of ending AIDS in children, of virtually eliminating pediatric AIDS. You will do that only through a health system that is addressing the principal challenges of maternal and child health from uh, even before antenatal care, what sort of information is being given? What are the uh, best protections uh, in terms of avoiding? I mean, what, what's the best way to prevent new pediatric infections is to prevent a mother from uh, get, having unwanted pregnancies or uh, contracting the virus in the first place. And importantly, within the context of each culture of, of each country and each community that you serve, it's not a matter of taking some sort of templated approach or, or a theoretical model and, and opposing it. it. The whole idea of attitudes, cultural context, um, linguistic differences, all these different nuances are so important to your ultimate success. That's exactly right. Um, we work with a number of, uh, uh, we work with them, I know a number of women who have gone through horrific experience of discovering they were HIV positive. Um, Florence uh, particularly comes to mind, lost her da daughter um, to the virus. Florence is on treatment, she's very healthy. Um, and the best thing she felt she could do was to become a counselor to uh, other women. And so she works at site. She works with Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation and, and does other work in, in her uh, home country of, of South Africa. Um, but because of her knowledge and because she fell in love with a man who completely understood her circumstances and they were married and they have two healthy children, um, both HIV uh, negative, um, precisely because she knew what was available, how to seek that kind of support and treatment. And she's just a, um, an amazingly effective counselor at the community level with other women. I know what you're feeling. I know what you're going through. I know, believe me, look at me. This is how it can be managed. This is where you can get to um, if you want uh, to try and have a, a child. How does your funding work? We are um, a lead implementing partner of uh, something called PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief. That was started by uh, President Bush 12 years ago. That provided the uh, early funding to scale up um, the distribution of the early medicines that were having an impact um, in reducing uh, new infections and getting people on uh, treatment. That program has continued under President Obama, and so a substantial part of our funding comes from the overall PEPFAR program, which is administered by USAID and the Centers for Disease Control, and both of those organizations look to um, EGPAF, is our acronym, Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Um, uh, both organizations look to uh, EGPAF as a pre preeminent uh, implementation partner. In addition, there are a number of foundations, corporations, and individuals that provide uh, support for us. And you're quite familiar with the whole process and the 
the ecosystem surrounding uh, foundations that have missions and uh, organizations that, that provide operating um, power behind those missions. Talk about your career trajectory and how you arrived at this point in your career. Uh, good fortune is how I arrived at uh, this point, I think. Um, I feel extraordinarily uh, um, fortunate uh, to be able to do the work that I do. I, I, I worked for UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund, um, for a, a number of years, uh, both in New York um, in its headquarters and in the field in Mozambique. I was in Mozambique for three years, the late 80s. Mm -hmm. early uh, 90s. Complex times. Um, uh, Mozambique went through horrific experience. At that time, the World Bank regarded it as the world's poorest country. Even in 1990, per capita GNP dropped to $98. dollars That's not even a dollar a day. That's 30 cents uh, a day. And there was a horrific uh, civil war that was exacerbated by the apartheid government in uh, South Africa. So it was intense. I uh, spent a lot of time in health sites and other places where UNICEF was providing assistance um, of a kind that I think most people just uh, couldn't Im uh, imagine. Um, I, so I've just been, I've spent a lot of time working on uh, child survival and development uh, issues with um, good organizations that were having global impact as well as on the ground uh, impact. You have a fairly complex model for delivering your services. Talk about how that model works. Um, I, well, it starts with um, both a, a premise and from experience a belief that with a mission to end AIDS in children, that implies a scope that goes beyond just what our organization uh, can do. And so to scale up the activity, to reach all the kids that need to be reached, to reach all the uh, adults that need to be reached, you have to work through other systems, established systems. But our model is to work through and with ministries of health, with community-based organizations. We're uh, an international organization, and we both recognize and profoundly respect the knowledge, the responsibilities, the uh, capacity that exists on the ground, and that's what we augment with our technical assistance, our training, our mentoring, our data collection and monitoring, and, and so on. And you have various affiliates that, that are within each country? And so a step that we've uh, taken in, in the last several years was to begin to transfer more of our work in five of the four countries that we are working in um, to organizations in two of the five countries that already existed um, in uh, Zambia and South Africa, for example, um, and in three other countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, and Mozambique. We led a very deliberate effort to help start a new organization. Everything from governance and systems to staffing and strategy and new business uh, development. Each one of those organizations, we have an affiliation agreement uh, with them. Uh, we uh, do organizational um, assessment of their strengths and weaknesses together with their boards so they can address areas that jointly we think um, they need to strengthen. We seconded a number of our own staff at the very beginning so you know end of the day on a Friday these organizations didn't exist. 9 a.m. on a Monday these three organizations existed and they had meaningful productive meetings by noon on Monday because it was primarily staff from our organizations that had made the decision uh, to be a part of this new organization. We believe that's central to not an exit strategy, but a transition strategy. We still have an enormous amount of work to be done, but at the end of the day, and uh, PEPFAR believes this, the United States government believes this, um, the most effective response to HIV and AIDS, and indeed larger uh, health challenges, um, is going to come from the ownership, the understanding, and the leadership of national organizations, government, 
NGOs, it's local buy-in, local ownership, local control, local knowledge. Um, they are affiliated with us in the case of the three organizations that we we help to stand up, but they are independent. We have one uh, board seat on each one of them. I uh, meet them sometimes, just Skype participation in uh, board meetings. Uh, it's at the end of the day, it's their responsibility to manage the response to their epidemic. Um, recognizing at the same time and welcoming strong additional assistance from uh, from ourselves and, and others but really being put into a leadership position that's been their competence already has been recognized by CDC for example that is funding them directly they're not funding us to fund them it's direct which is a major step for a three-year-old organization to have the competence the wherewithal to be directly funded by, uh, say, the Centers for Disease Control, to be meeting targets, to be providing the training. Um, and in Tanzania, for example, in each one of the three affiliates, 100% of the staff are nationals, the doctors, the, the grant manager, the IT person, uh, et cetera. Um, and we believe that's absolutely the right direction to go in. Um, it's our firm belief that given our mission focus, and there's many years of work still, but we, we see, we want, uh, it, it's almost cliche to say it, but it's uh, a genuine intention. We do see ourselves someday going out of business as an organization dedicated to ending AIDS in children because the kinds of progress we've seen over the last 10 years uh, continues um, uh, geometrically. And the leadership capacity, the technical uh, acumen exists in the countries where we've been working so that they will continue. Chip Lyons, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Elizabeth Baser Pediatric AIDS Foundation with us. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you very much. It's been fun.